<clears throat> well, it's, um, I was a big fan of Senna's. I watched all of those races live, and um, I think, for me, one of the problems with modern movies are that people will put an explosion in, or they'll put a love interest in. They'll do it because it's a big formula. There is a formula for movie making. There's a formula for building GT cars, for Formula One cars. But for me personally, and then very soon for the team, it was a really simple aim that we had when we made the film, which was you had to feel exactly the same way as a fan did throughout his career. And whether you knew what the ending was or whether you didn't know what the ending was, when you got to Imola, you had to feel as we all did when we watched TV. And I think part of the reason why so many people felt very numb at the end of the film was, it was, it was brilliant actually, it was a Belgian fan who, um, who wrote this to us. He said, Senna, when he was killed, it was so brutal, so immediate, that we never really had time to mourn him. Suddenly there were a bunch of newspaper headlines and he just wasn't at Monaco. And I have a feeling what this film has done is it's given people a chance to go back over his life, go back over his life. And I, I hate that word, closure, but I think when people go and see this film, when they come out of this film, there's a kind of closure. Yeah. Terry, you have very uh, vivid and personal memories of working with Ayrton. Do you think he is um, sort of, uh, do you think the eulogies and the myths surrounding him are greater because he was killed doing what he was famous for doing? Yeah, I think when uh, <clears throat> when people die at the top of their the top of their game, the top of their sport, or whatever, you know, like people like James Dean, Elvis Presley, you know, so I think it does have a a different effect on on uh, on people, without a doubt. Yeah, but um, that shouldn't take away at all from the fact that you know Ayrton, Ayrton was a phenomenal Formula One driver, and um, the film shows that. And uh, so, although you know he did die too young, um, he's left a tremendous legacy for. Uh, for young people to look up to and things like that, you know. And, you know, I admired him enormously for what he did in, in car racing. So terrible shame that he died. So. You were better than him in karts for, for many years. Did he, were you, were you conscious that he was trying to learn from you? Or did you learn anything from him? Um, I was conscious he was trying to learn stuff from me, without a doubt, yeah, which is, you know, what you'd expect. I've been around a lot longer than him and so learned a lot of the tricks of the trade. So he was uh, looking to, to learn off me. Um, and what he did for me was really keep me on my toes. He was so fast and so, uh, so determined and so focused that you couldn't relax at all. Um, he was, you know, be nipping at my heels instantly. So it really kept me at the top of my game um, for probably an extended period of time, actually. So, so that, was the, that was the impression, and that was the effect he had on me. And I think um, he did try and, he did, well, I know he did try and learn from me, and he did learn some stuff from me, so. There's a great clip, actually, that we couldn't put into the film of um, Senna when he's 20, sitting next to Terry in a tent. <laughs> Terry's actually having a cigarette like this. It's a great clip. You've got it in the corner of your mouth, and I think you're, um, I don't know what you're doing to your carburetor, you're doing something there. And Senna's sitting there, trying not to look, and going, like that, just literally watching what you're doing to the millimetre. I guess there was an element of master and pupil, wasn't there? Because you were a little bit older than him. Yeah, it was a little bit like that, but, you know, I wasn't really the... You know, I wasn't really setting myself up to be the teacher. I was setting myself up to try and win as many races as I could. So if, um, if I was too open with everything, um, he'd have probably learnt too quickly and been kicking my ass too soon. So, so that was, you know, that was uppermost in my mind. And uh, I did keep some of the stuff, uh, you know, fairly close to my chest. Um, and he did try the, as best he could to learn as fast as possible. So um, it was just a kind of a, a war, you know, a little, a little war where um, one person gets a little bit better and learns something, and the other person has to learn something to cope with it. So. And then, of course, in later years, you'd have watched him and that obsessive attention to detail and, and desire to, to be the best. With Prost, you must have sort of thought, oh, yeah, there he goes again. Yeah, a little bit. I understood, I, I understood his personality and how he would be and how he, he would just re would refuse to be second. That was, uh, that was very evident in karting already. So, um, you know, he had quite a hard time in karts because he never won the world championships, the best he was second, which is still pretty phenomenal. But um, he was uh, always a little frustrated in karts because he never quite hit the top. And then once he moved to cars, he seemed to do very, very well at every level and uh, seemed more in his element, to be quite honest. But um, the other thing you need to remember is he was actually raced carts for a hell of a long time. He was involved with carts for, I think, 13 or 14 years. 
which is longer than he was involved with racing cars. So, you know, I mean, this massive part that, of his that's, career was That's karting. weird to think, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Because yeah. He was actually sitting in a go-kart when he was five years old. And I think racing by the time he was seven or eight. Manish would know that better than me, probably. But, and then, you know, right the way up till he was 20, he it was, it was karting. Yeah. So, and then 20 to 34 was, was racing cars. So roughly the same amount of time in carts and cars. Yeah, and only 10 years, 10 calendar years, uh, 11 seasons in Formula One. Um, it seems amazing that he, he achieved so much in a relatively short space of time. I think that's what, um, when you look at somebody like Rubens Barrichello trying to get the drive at Williams next year, you know, it's 20 years in Formula One. We've already got, Jensen's been in Formula One since 1999, so he's about to go into his 13th Yeah, 2000, season. yeah. So yeah, sorry, it's already, yeah, yeah, already longer. Yeah, than, uh, yeah. Uh, the, you know, he was, a, he was with us for such a short period of time when, um, it, it was, it, well, Tara and I talked about it once. I mean, in a way, drivers were so different in that era. You need to see it in the film. It was analog driving. It wasn't digital driving. The driver had to do so much. There was so much of the setting up, so much liaison with the engineers that the driver was responsible for. And, th and that's, for me, why he was such a complete driver. And I think they're probably, for my money, two guys who are intellectually on a par with Senna in modern Formula One. It's Vettel and Alonso. They're the two brightest guys in Formula One. But there's a kind of, sounds mad, there's a kind of macho quality, you know, that kind of I'm not going to lose. And I think f for my money, probably Alonso is the only one who has, has both right now. Terry, Ayrton was always, uh, he was a, a very spiritual and emotional guy. And he believed that, that, that God would protect him while he was racing. Did you see evidence of that f uh, at the beginning in karting when he was a young man? No, I didn't, to be honest. <clears throat> In those, those early years, when he was 17, 18, 19, that ki kind of period of his life, um, there was none of that was evident at all, to be quite honest. What was evident was his determination and obsession um, to, to, you know, to be successful at what he was doing. Um, and, I, you know, obsession is a, is a good word to use for it. It was not just a desire. It was stronger than that. He was obsessed about succeeding. Um, but, no, I saw no spiritual stuff, no side of that. I saw it quite an emotional, soft side to him. Um, you know, he'd, sometimes he'd lend me music to play in the, in the transporter <coughs> and it was always quite romantic, soft music and things like that, which was a little bit of a surprise. You know, you expect him to give you some heavy rock or something like that, you know, but it wasn't. It was quite, you know, normally ballads and things like that. So, yeah, it was, it was uh, not spiritual, but emotional and a gentle side to him, his nature. Guys, I wish these slots on the stage were longer, but just briefly before we finish, Manish, just if you can, in five minutes, encapsulate the whole journey that you went on making this film. I, I've talked to you at length about it in, in the past, but I think the, uh, the support you had, particularly from the Senna family and from Bernie Eccleston, was um, quite extraordinary. Yeah, I think um, if you really want to do something with your heart, and I really believe this now, um, obviously you can't make stuff up. You've got to do your homework. You've got to do the technical bits, but I think you can go up to a family like the Senna's. I think you can go up to a man like Bernie Eccleston. I think these, these, these are not stupid people. They meet people all the time. And I think if you can present what you want to do in a very clear, logical way, as well as a very emotional way, and that, that's the balance for me. And to be honest, that's what got this film made. It was an absolute balance between the emotional and between the technical. And we, we knew what we were doing as filmmakers. It's just that, you know, why would the Senna's believe us? Why would Bernie want to help us? And, you know, being here today is just, you know, it's just another aspect of that amazing journey. And for me, the, the big pride is that everyone knows who Senna is again. And it's a great thing. And another great pride is that everyone knows who the best karting driver of all time is as well. And you worked closely with Edson's sister and, of course, his nephew uh, and niece, Bruno, um, and they were, they just loved it, didn't they? Yeah, I It took a while to get them on board and to get it all signed, but in the end, they were very happy. Yeah, everybody made handshake deals, but these are, these are professionals, so there's a contract. There's a contractual phase. It took two years to get signatures that we needed to get the film going, but once we had their cooperation, and we had all their cooperation, and um, for me, the, the most magical moment in this film was we, uh, we got to show Viviani and Bianca the whole film, um, a year ago in, uh, in Cannes. We managed to get a cinema and, um, well, I think it's almost two years ago in Cannes. And uh, we only had the cinema for two hours. Viviane, who wasn't at Imola, um, this is his sister, watched the whole film like this 
And then when it got to Imola, they were crying their eyes out. But outside the cinema afterwards, they said, thank you so much. You really captured the balance between the genius and the human being. And you, you don't get better compliment than that. I agree. Guys, great to see you. Thank you very much for coming on and uh, sharing those special memories of a, of a special guy. Ladies and gentlemen, Manish Pandey and Terry Fullerton.